All right. So, so far this week, we've talked about how our brain and organs work together to prepare for food to come into our body, how our food gets into our body and the series of organs that it goes through. And then we've talked about digestion. So how the different organs in our gastrointestinal tract work together to break apart all those nutrients from our food. So this last portion is going to be solely focused on absorption, which is what we're doing with that food once it's been broken down. So getting it across cellular membranes into our surrounding tissue, whether that's in the stomach, in the small intestine or large intestine, and then how those nutrients get out of those lining cells and into our bloodstream. So, so like I said, we've already talked about digestion. In this PowerPoint, we'll be going over absorption, the process of moving these small molecules. So after digestion, breaking them from large to small, and then getting those small molecules across cell membranes and into the lining cells. And then ultimately into the bloodstream, and then from the bloodstream into whatever cells need it. And then um, elimination is just the last stage. So whatever was left over after digestion and absorption will be stored in the, in the large intestine for 12 to 24 hours before we um, eliminate it as, as feces. So we're going to have a small amount of absorption occurring in the stomach, a large amount, almost all of our absorption happening in the small intestine, and then a very, very tiny amount of absorption occurring in the large intestine. Right. So most of our nutrients need to make it to the small intestine in order to actually get into our body and be usable. And again, in order for those to um, actually be absorbed, we need to break apart these large macromolecules into their individual pieces parts. So for carbs, that is breaking them down into single sugars, monosaccharides. For lipids, we're trying to break all the fatty acid tails off of our larger triglycerides. Um, so we're left with a single monoglyceride and then the remaining fatty acids. And then proteins, we're trying to completely unravel and denature them and then break apart every amino acid. So we'll be digesting these large macromolecules and absorbing their smaller pieces. So in the stomach, we're mostly just absorbing water and drugs, so any medicines. Um, their coating is designed to dissolve in the hydrochloric acid of the stomach and then be absorbed. We also have absorption of the vitamin B12, but that's really the only exception to this list here. The small intestine, we are going to absorb everything. So all of our monosaccharides, fatty acids, monoglycerides, and amino acids. And then anything that's left over and makes it to the large intestine, um, we're typically only going to be absorbing water in this part. However, some minerals will make it all the way to here and then be absorbed. And then the bacteria in our large intestine will help break apart some of that fiber that we um, consumed and were unable to digest. And as a result of their digestion of fiber, they release some small fatty acids. So our small intestine is literally designed to absorb, or not designed because this wasn't intentional, but has evolved this uh, incredible structure that makes it extremely efficient at absorption. And that's all focused around increasing the surface area of the cells that line your small intestine. So, uh, we have lots and lots of folds, essentially. Every fold is squeezing the, the cell or tissue so that there's much more of the, the membrane that is available to all the food that's moving through that small intestine. So we have villi, which are much larger folds in the tissue lining, allowing those cells to come into close contact with those nutrients. And then along these villi, um, all of the individual cells that line the outside of this tissue create what is called the brush border. And this brush border is simply composed of even smaller folds called microvilli, which increase the surface area of each of those individual cells. So villi increase the surface area of the tissue. So we have a bunch of cells lined together into these folds. And then each of those individual cells extends their cilia, which is a, a part of the, the protein matrix that um, makes up the internal skeleton of a cell. They will extend those proteins um, pushing the cell membrane so that it has even more surface area. So you can see what that looks like here. Right? So each of these folds are villi. We have a, a lining of intestinal cells making up these villi with our capillaries and lymph uh, nodes in between. And then each of those individual cells along the outside here have these microvilli. And again, these are extensions of the plasma membrane by pushing protein fibers thus pushing open that plasma membrane more 
and increase in that surface area even further. So we really have three folds. Okay. The larger portion of the tissue is squeezed into these. And then the smaller individual linings of cells that make up the tissue are pushed into villi. And then each of those individual cells has their own extensions, microvilli. So just all these adaptations, all these specializations increase the surface area and thus increase the exposure of these cells to the nutrients that are coming through our small intestine. So the more exposure to, to cell membranes that those nutrients have, the more likely they are to cross those plasma membranes, right? There's more opportunity because there's more surface area. And so just to revisit kind of our cell transport or different types of transport across cell membranes, we have simple diffusion, which is just those molecules moving based on concentration gradients. So if there's a lot of them on one side of the plasma membrane, that will force them to, to move towards where there's more space, but only really small uncharged molecules can simply diffuse across the membrane. We have facilitated diffusion, which is driven by the same force by concentration gradient. So if there's a lot outside the cell, that will cause them to want to get into, inside the cell. But if they're large or carrying a charge, that will require a protein to help them do that. So that, call that facilitated diffusion. And then lastly, we have active transport. So some molecules are so large or electrically charged that they need energy to actually move across the membrane. But there are also molecules that are going to be moving against their concentration gradient, such as carbohydrates. Right? Our cells are pretty concentrated or have a, a high density of carbohydrates in them. It's a major energy source for our cells. And so getting carbohydrates into the cell is typically going to require some sort of energy and thus active transport. So we have our examples here. So small nutrients like water and tiny lipids are able to just simply diffuse across the membrane. Um, some of the water-soluble vitamins are going to need to be absorbed by facilitated diffusion. So they're a bit larger and thus need that help to get actually into the cell, even though they're naturally being driven to do so. And then nutrients like glucose are, are simple carbohydrate and amino acids are going to require some type of energy to assist them in getting into the cell, usually because they're going against their concentration gradient. So they're moving to where there's much more of those carbohydrates and proteins inside the cell. So we're gonna look at all three of our macronutrients, how they get into the cell and where they're going. So not only do we have different types of transport moving these nutrients into our intestinal lining cells um, and then into the bloodstream, um, each of these nutrients is going to differ on where they go first. So carbohydrates and proteins are going to go directly into the capillaries, which is going to take them to the liver first. Um, just skipping ahead here. So carbohydrates come into the cell, and then when they leave the cell, they go directly into the capillaries, which takes them to the liver. So how do they even get in and how do they get out? So like I said, there's a high concentration of carbohydrates inside of our cells. It's our main energy source. There's always a lot of them there. And so in order to move these monosaccharides out of our small intestine and into our intestinal lining cells, they use a form of active transport called co-transport. So a different molecule such as sodium will move with its concentration gradient. So this, is, this would be simple diffusion. Sodium is just moving into the cell where there's less of it. However, these proteins can utilize the energy that is created from those sodiums moving with their concentration gradient to also help our monosaccharides move against their concentration gradient. So this is what is called co-transport or indirect active transport. We're not using ATP, but we're using the energy that is produced by these other molecules moving with their concentration gradient to help this other molecule go against its concentration gradient. So monosaccharides get into our intestinal lining through co-transport and then simply using facilitated diffusion, because again, there's a lot of carbohydrates in this cell. So they're moving with their concentration gradient now when they leave the cell. And we just use a protein to help them do that. So facilitated diffusion will get that monosaccharide out of the intestinal lining cell and into our capillaries, and they will go to the liver. Bats skip the liver, right? So um, with the, the help of bile from the gallbladder, uh, which was originally produced by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and then the gallbladder really sit into the small intestine, that those bile molecules, those bile salts, are going to help surround all these fatty acids and monoglycerides, creating a micelle. 
this micelle is going to be able to simply fuse with our plasma membrane since it's also made up of lipids and fats. And that will release all these free fatty acids and monoglycerides into the intestinal lining cell. And so they can simply diffuse across this membrane. Um, those monoglycerides and fatty acids are then going to be reformed into this, their larger triglycerides. Those triglycerides will be surrounded with proteins, and those proteins will help them exit the cell via active transport. So exocytosis is a fancy term for um, moving something out of a cell uh, with energy. So this is active transport. Those proteins will use ATP to help get these fats out of the cell and they will actually go straight to our lymphatic system. So they're skipping these capillaries. They're gonna skip the liver and go straight to the lymph. The lymphatic system will then dump them back into the circulatory system, so back into the capillaries, after they have passed the liver. So our fats, our lipids, are the only macronutrient here that skip the liver. The liver is typically what is going to determine where these nutrients go, or I guess specifically for carbohydrates, and proteins, they determine where those nutrients are going to go, or if they're just going to simply store them in the liver for later. Fats, however, are going to skip the liver. They're going to completely go through the, the entire circulatory system first before they make it back to the liver. Right. So they skip the liver and go straight to circulation. Proteins, similar to carbohydrates, are going to go to the liver first. So the only exception to this rule are our fats. Carbohydrates and proteins go into our capillaries and then to the liver. Fats skip the liver and go straight into our lymph system, which will dump them back into our circulatory system later. So for proteins, uh, we have co-transport, similar to uh, what we were just looking at with carbohydrates in order to get into our intestinal lining. So we have our small peptides, to either individual amino acids or two amino acids together, which makes a dipeptide, or three amino acids together, which makes a tripeptide. So very, very small compared to the hundreds or thousands of amino acids that make up typical proteins. So these very, very tiny proteins are going to be brought into the cell via co-transport. So moving against their concentration gradient, we can use the energy from a molecule like sodium moving with its concentration gradient to help them get across. And then active transport is going to be needed in order to get them into our capillaries. So even though they're now going to go against their concentration gradient, they're very large, um, or sorry, with their concentration gradient, they're still very large, and so require energy to actually cross that plasma membrane. So this is where we'll use ATP to get these small peptides and amino acids into the capillaries and then to the liver. Okay. So what about our micronutrients? So a lot of our vitamins and minerals are being absorbed in our small intestine. Some of them are going to be absorbed in the large intestine. So our lipid-soluble vitamins, those hydrophobic vitamins like vitamins A, D, E, and K, will just be dissolved in the lipids. Um, some are going to be using carrier proteins, either to do facilitated diffusion or active transport. And then some can simply diffuse across the membrane channels themselves. So everything that's left over after absorption from the stomach and the small intestine will make it into the large intestine. And so this is mostly just going to be our fiber, um, some of our small, smaller macronutrients or some macronutrients, sorry. This is mostly going to be fiber, some of our micronutrients um, and water left over by the time they get to the large intestine. And so we have very little digestion here. The only digestion that is occurring is from the bacteria that are already there or the bacteria that came with your food. Um, the rest of that material will be stored in the large intestine for 12 to 24 hours before you eliminate it as feces. So the only absorption we have here is water, some of our micronutrients, and then a little bit of fatty acid absorption does happen here because when the bacteria digest that fiber, they will release tiny fatty acids as uh, a byproduct of that digestion. So again, the only things left from your food that are making it to the large intestine are mostly going to be fiber, any bacteria that were in that food, and the remaining water. So the beneficial bacteria that live in your large intestine will continue digestion of things like fiber and release these short chain fatty acids as a byproduct that we can absorb. Um, but mainly the job of the large intestine is to prepare whatever was left for elimination. So to remove it from our body. 
So again, just showing this reference slide here, this is uh, a really great overlook at all of digestion and absorption. So wherever you see these white dots occurring, that's digestion. Whenever those have fully disappeared, those molecules have been fully absorbed. So carbohydrates start digestion in the mouth since we have amylase in our saliva to help chemically digest those carbohydrates. Their digestion stops in the stomach and then picks back up again in the small intestine. And by the end of the small intestine, they will all of the carbohydrates we're using will have been absorbed. Fiber cannot be digested by our human enzymes. So fiber makes it all the way to the large intestine where bacteria will be able to digest some of it and release fatty acids for us to absorb. But most of the fiber you consume will just be excreted. Um, so it's very helpful for increasing satiety, helping you feel full. And the more fiber in a piece of food, the more full you're going to feel um, because you, you can't digest it. it. It is in there the whole time, all the way through the large intestine. Proteins don't start being digested until the stomach with that enzyme pepsin and then with other proteases in the small intestine. And they will, we will have a little bit of absorption of proteins of small peptides in the stomach, but mostly absorbed in the small intestine. Um, so they're finished by the end. Fats, we have a teeny, teeny, tiny bit of lipase that does come with our, salivary, with our saliva. So we have salivary lipase. So some digestion of fats in the mouth, but most of your fat is going to make it all the way to the small intestine before it is digested and then absorbed. Right. So as I uh, mentioned earlier, lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins, so the vitamins that are going to be dissolved in those fats, are going to skip the liver entirely the first time around. So they go directly into the lymph system, which empties into the bloodstream after the liver. So this means lipids and lipid-soluble vitamins get to go a full round all the way through your circulatory system before they get to the liver if they even make it to the liver, right? If those fats are being absorbed or if they're gonna be stored in your adipose tissue, then they won't make it to the liver. All of our other nutrients are going um, directly to the liver from the bloodstream. So if they're leaving the small intestine and going into the capillaries, their first stop is going to be the liver before they go through the rest of the body. And this liver, or our livers, are responsible for storing, processing, and regulating the release of these nutrients. So we store a lot of our sugars as a complex poly, uh, polysaccharide known as glycogen. Right? We have glycogen for um, carbohydrate storage in a lot of our cells as well, but a very large concentration of glycogen is in our liver. Um, some of the fats that are gonna make it back after that first time around can be stored in the liver, but they'll typically be sent out um, to be stored as adipose tissue elsewhere, so as fat cells elsewhere. And so again, the liver controls all of that. So it's determining what is going to be stored what is going to be changed. So we, our bodies also have the ability to change amino acids, small lipids, and uh, monosaccharides uh, into each other, right? So if we need monosaccharides for something and all we have is a bunch of fat, we can change those fatty acid tails into monosaccharides um, and then regulating when and where they are released. And so no matter what, the liver ends up filtering all of your blood eventually. So even those molecules that go into the lymph lymphatic system first will make it all the way back around and be filtered by the liver eventually. So you can see that here. So we have our capillaries going from our digestive tract straight to the liver. We have our lymph system bypassing the liver before it, um, it is distributing those nutrients back into the circulatory system here. And again, once um, these molecules have left the liver, or any of the fats that have come from our digestion, they will then circulate through the heart, back out through the lungs, through the heart again, and then through the rest of the body. So that is all, right? Um, our digestive system again, dumps into the circulatory system through the liver or through the lymph system for lipids. So that's all for this chapter on absorption. Um, please reach out with any questions or concerns and I will see you guys next time.